Good morning. Today we're going on a trip back in time to the day of the Boston Massacre, a time when America hadn't established independence from Britain and a time when Americans had close to no freedom due to the restrictions of King George III. The Boston Massacre would mark the beginning of our second president's career and be one of the final straws for the Americans before the American Revolution. There were slight controversies over the exact events that took place during the Boston Massacre. The following are the colonist accounts of the massacre that were published in the Boston Gazette on March 12, 1770. On Monday, March 5, 1770, many soldiers from the 29th Regiment were seen around and walking the streets. Around 9 o'clock, four miners, Edward Archibald, William Merchant, Francis Archibald and John Leach were walking down Cornhill when they came across two soldiers, one of which was brandishing a large sword against the walls. Edward admonished William to take care of the sword, and the soldier turned around and struck Edward on the arm and then pushed William, piercing through his clothes and grazing his armpit. William then hit the soldier with his stick. The other soldier then went and got two more men, one armed with tongs and the other with a shovel. The one with tongs chased Edward down the alley and hit him in the head with the tongs. People could hear the noise, and John Hicks, a young lad, knocked the soldier down, but then let him back up again. More kids gathered and drove the soldiers back to the barrack. In less than a minute, ten or twelve soldiers came out with drawn cutlasses, clubs, and bayonets. They set upon the unarmed boys, and realizing that their equipment was overpowered, the boys dispersed. When he heard the noise, Samuel Atwood came to see what was happening. He met the ten or twelve soldiers coming down the alley towards the square and asked them if they were going to kill. They answered yes, and with that, one of the men hit Mr. Atwood with a club upon the head. They continued hitting him with clubs, and Atwood endured a heavy blow to his shoulder. These soldiers continued traveling down Cornhill Street. Thirty or forty people had gathered on King Street, mostly young boys. Captain Preston and his men were traveling down the street, pushing their bayonets, yelling, Make way. When they reached the custom house, people began throwing snowballs. On this, the captain commanded the men to fire. One soldier then fired, and a townsman with a cudgel struck him over the hands with such force that he dropped his firelock, and rushing forward, he aimed a blow at the captain's head, which ended up falling pretty heavily upon his arm. The soldiers continued firing until seven or eight, or as some say, eleven guns discharged. The following is a quote from Captain Thomas Preston on the event of the Boston Massacre. On Monday night, about 8 o'clock, two soldiers were attacked and beat. But the party of the townspeople, in order to carry matters into the utmost length, broke into two town meeting houses and rang the alarm bells, which I suppose was for fire, as usual, but was soon undeceived. About nine, some of the guard came to and informed me the town inhabitants were assembling to attack the troops and that the bells were ringing at the signal for that purpose and not for fire, and the beacon intended to be fired to bring in the distant people of the country. This, as I was the captain of the day, associated my repairing immediately to the main guard. In my way there, I saw the people in great commotion, and heard them use the most cruel and horrible threats against the troops. In a few minutes, after I reached the guard, about a hundred people passed it and went towards the custom house, where the king's money is lodged. They immediately surrounded the sentry posted there, and with clubs and other weapons threatened to execute their vengeance on them. I was soon informed by a townsman their intention was to carry off the soldier from its post and probably murder him, on which I desired him to return to for further intelligence and he soon came back and assured me he heard the mob declare they wouldn't murder him this i feared might be a prelude to the plundering the king's chest i immediately sent a non-commissioned officer and twelve men to protect both the sentry and the king's money and very soon followed myself to prevent if possible all disorder fearing lest the officer and soldiers by the insults and provocations of the rioters should be thrown off their guard and commit some rash act. They soon rushed through the people and by charging their bayonets in half circles kept them at a little distance. Nay, so far was I informed intending the death of any person that I suffered 
the troops to go to the spot where the unhappy affair took place without any loading of their pieces, nor did I give them any for loading them. This remiss conduct in me perhaps merits its censure, yet to act offensively but the contrary part, and not that without compulsion. The mob still increased and were more outrageous, striking their clubs and bludgeons one against another, and calling out, Come on, you rascals, you bloody backs, you lobster, used at this time I was between the soldiers and the mob, paralleling with them, and endeavoring all the power to persuade the muzzles of the pieces, and seemed to be endeavored to close with the soldiers on which some well-behaved persons asked means, observing to them I was advanced before the muscles of the men's pieces, and must fall a sacrifice if they would prove to me no officer. While I was thus speaking, one of the soldiers, having received a severe blow with a stick, stepped a little on one side and instantly fired, on which turning to and asking him why he fired without orders, I was struck with a club on my arm, which for some time deprived me of the use of it, which blow, had it been placed on my head, most probably would have destroyed me. Both the accounts of the colonists, published in the Boston Gazette and Captain Thomas Preston's accounts of the Boston Massacre, were factual. The difference of the two accounts was the dispute between who actually yelled fire. In the Boston Massacre trial, Captain Preston and his soldiers were represented by John Adams. Speaking of the trials, John Adams stated the following. The part I took in defense of Captain Preston and the soldiers procured me anxiety and obliquy enough. It was, however, one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life, and one of the best pieces of service I ever rendered my country. Judgment of death against those soldiers would have been as foul a stain upon this country as the executions of the Quakers or witches anciently. As the evidence was, the verdict of the jury was exactly right. John Adams won the case through the testimonies of his witnesses. His witnesses stated that Captain Preston never ordered his men to fire upon the crowd. This Boston massacre caused the death of five men, Crispus Attucks, James Codwell, Samuel Gray, Samuel Maverick, and Patrick Carr. The Boston Massacre was a milestone for American independence. Howdy y'all. All of us here at Dackney McThomas Productions hope that you enjoyed our little video presentation on the Boston Massacre. Just remember that the Boston Massacre wasn't a laughing matter. Five dudes got shot and four died right on the spot. <laughs> also, Another tidbit you probably want to take with you is that the Gazette and Tom's Preston's account of what happened were actually dang there the truth. Besides, who gave the order to fire? The Brits were being represented by our nation's second president, John Adams of Boston. John Adams won the case for them there Brits, and the townspeople people were dang there gonna explode with fairy because they hated them there British soldiers for being stupid. Well, anyway, we hope that this wasn't a complete waste of our time, because 10 minutes takes a lot longer to record than some of y'all might think. <coughs> Miss Black. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, y'all. We'll see you next time right here on Dakini McThomas Productions.